we want to tell you about another podcast from PRX called Monumental. This podcast explores questions about the past, present, and future of U.S. monuments, uncovering the stories about what and who is important, as well as the stories that have been left out. Join host Ashley Seaford across the country with their team of journalists. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, September 1995, Oregon Senator Bob Packwood resigns before he could be expelled for sexual misconduct with staffers, the result of a years-long scandal. A Senate committee had voted unanimously that the Republican senator be expelled from the Senate. But the very long, way too long path to that vote is the real story here. There was a bombshell report in The Washington Post in the fall of 1992, three years earlier, and there were delayed Senate committee hearings for years and years. And finally, then in 1995, the Senate gets its act together and the Ethics Committee dropped an indictment. It was 10 volumes of documentation, some 10,000 pages, much of it from Packwood's own writings and his diary, which we will get into. But the report from the Ethics Committee said, in part, Senator Packwood engaged in a pattern of abuse of his position of power and authority by repeatedly committing sexual misconduct, 18 separate unwanted and unwelcome sexual advances between 1969 and 1990, In most of these instances, the victims were members of Senator Packwood's staff or individuals whose livelihood were dependent upon or connected to the power and authority that he held. So let's talk about Packwood's misconduct, his expulsion, and really that story about the intersection of abuse and power and sexual misconduct, one that is as old as time, but certainly presaged uh, many of the conversations that happened in the Me Too movement many decades later. So... Here, as always, Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. Uh, this is one of those stories that gets like, you know, it feels like it's common knowledge and lore and it sort of gets referenced and name checked a bunch. And then you go and you actually look at the details and you're just like, oh my gosh, you know? Yeah, I think the Packwood Diaries became part of the political lexicon, but what they actually yeah. said is something that we maybe should spend some time on. Do you want to just do that now? Because that is the kind of most like, oh, my gosh, moment of this all is that the man kept diaries basically listing all of his misconduct. I mean, bragging about all of his misconduct for decades. Yes. And when he was called before one of the Senate committees, he pulled out his diary in order to exculpate himself, in order to to show that, oh, no, I'm actually innocent. Listen to this entry in my diary. And they were like oh, your, your diary has information about these things? Maybe we should see a copy of that. And he was like, oh, no, no, I didn't mean for you all to be able to see my diaries because they contained things like this. So here's one excerpt. Okay. I have one question. If she didn't want me to feather her nest, why did she come into the Xerox room? Sure, she used that old excuse that she had to make copies of the Brady Bill, but if you believe that, I have a room full of radical feminists you can boff. She knew I was copying stuff in there. I had my jacket off and my sleeves rolled up, revealing the well-defined musculature of my sinewy arms, which were always bulging with desire. I know what she wanted. Oh, can you believe gosh. that? Gosh. <laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, he's writing, like, fanfic, <laughs> like, romance novel. But also, like, pure BS parody. Oh, yeah, yeah, she said she was coming in to Xerox a bill, but I knew better. It's like, what? But, but that's, it's the copy that's the room. Job. <laughs> yeah. There's, Ooh, I just, this is what kills me. It's like, you know, I, I keep a journal, or used to, but, like, I would never. Like, the, 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 the sort of self-aggrandizing way that you think of yourself as, like, my bulging muscles. What? Like, it just, it's almost comical. But the fact that he's, like, serious is, is what's mm-hmm. even more terrifying about these, these entries. So braggadocious. Yeah, yeah. So, how to phrase this. I mean, Packwood, both in defense and, I think, in behavior, does not see this as grooming or abuse Mm -hmm. in the way that I think people on the outside clearly do. But I mean, he, you know, time and time again, both in his own writing and his own self mythologizing and then in his actual defense basically says like, oh, no, you know, the the unwanted surprise French kiss or the groping or the grabbing people by the arms and the waist, you know, in the copy room. That's just kind of how men should behave. And here's the 
thing that I will say. Obviously, he is incorrect, but he is not alone. Mm. He comes into the Senate in 1969, and uh, we'll talk more about his path uh, to 1995. But at the time, he became the youngest member of the Senate, uh, replacing who had been the youngest member of the Senate, uh, Ted Kennedy. And if you read some of the things that Ted Kennedy did while he was in office to women, um, it is at least this bad, if not worse. And so the, the way that women were being abused on the Hill... Um, Packwood is really the only one held responsible, um, which makes him the exception more so than his behavior. Mm. What to me is what's um, I think so upsetting about a lot of this is that, you know, he comes in, as you said, the youngest senator, but he's also like the one of the first senators to put forth this um, abortion legalization bill. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Gloria Steinem raises hundreds of thousands of dollars for his reelection. He's one of the first to sign an anti-sexual harassment guidelines. Like, he is one of two Republicans to vote against the nomination of Clarence Thomas. Like, you would think on paper, oh, this guy, he's, he's... He's on he's our side. Ally. Like he's a champion for yeah. women's rights and for you know. And then in his private life, you can't even really say in his private life. I mean, in his professional life, behind closed doors, he's you know stick, trying to stick his tongue down women's throats. Like it just um, none of this can be reconciled. I think, and I think there are a lot of people who are probably shocked or maybe not so shocked to find out about his behavior. Yeah, but in his mind, it absolutely is reconciled, if not kind of like justified, right? Oh, I'm a champion of women, Mm -hmm. and it means that my personal behavior can be... Yeah, all women um, want me. Right, right. right. Uh, Go ahead, Nikki. Well, I, I, I think Kelly's laid it all out that this was somebody who put himself forward as essentially a feminist and someone who is protecting women's rights and protecting their rights from sexual harassment. We've talked before about the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas hearings that happened in 1991 and how they bring to the fore this conversation about what sexual harassment is, why it's not okay. Um, And Packwood was knee deep in those conversations, right? right? Like in voting against Clarence Thomas, he was voting against him in part because of this history. So he was holding someone else accountable for behavior that was frankly less egregious than what Packwood himself had done and was doing. And that's the thing that, like, oh, I know hypocrisy in politics is so meh, um, but it's breathtaking. Yeah. 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 The, the audacity of the hypocrisy. Hey there, Jody here, and I'm very excited to tell you that Wait For It is back for season two. Wait For It is one of the newer members of the Radiotopia family, but it is already one of the most acclaimed podcasts around. If I took the time to list every award and best of list that it has been on, we'd run out of time. So I'll just tell you that Wait For It is hosted by Ronald Young Jr. And by the way, Wait is W-E-I-G-H-T. And it tells not only his story, but the stories of all types of folks, fat and straight-sized, who can't seem to keep weight off their minds. This season features stories about grief, fat camp, air travel, as well as conversations with brilliant people like Martinez Evans and Aubrey Gordon of Maintenance Phase. The new season of Wait For It. It's audio storytelling at its very finest, and it launches September 5th. Congratulations to Ronald and the team, and congratulations to all of us for having a new season of Wait For It wherever we get our podcasts. But that Clarence Thomas context, I think, is really important because, okay, he arrives in the Senate in 69. His behavior seems to basically start pretty quickly. Um, It is not until the early 90s, until 1991, 1992, that word starts to get out about the way that he behaves. I mentioned this 1992, November 1992, Washington Post story. So this is a year after the Clarence Thomas hearings. Um, This Washington Post story comes out detailing claims of sexual misconduct, including some of the behavior that we've talked about. 20 women eventually come forward with allegations stretching back all the way into the 60s. Um, The Post delays their story a little bit until after the election. Packwood is up for election that fall. The Post delays the story because mostly because his office won't cooperate. And, you know, we saw this time and time again during Me Too. People who were accused would sort of Mm -hmm. slow play it and jam up the stuff Mm -hmm. and delay, delay, delay. 
we've seen another person accused of sexual assault employ that strategy of mm-hmm. delay, delay, delay. So Packwood kind of does that as well right around this election moment. Um, he is reelected, but then basically the Senate Ethics Committee and the Senate itself, and maybe this is where we bring, where we bring Barbara Boxer onto the stage, pressure really starts to mount to say we need to hold this person accountable. But as I said, we're talking about here fall winter of 1992 it is not until 1995 that the man is kicked out so what what happens in that stretch within the senate so one of the consequences of the clarence thomas hearings was that a bunch of women ran for congress and you had this new class of women senators who took office in january of 1993 and they are part of the push to try to get these investigations done to try to get open hearings but there is just a ton of delay first of all packwood as the scandal comes to light. He checks himself into um, a rehab facility for alcoholism. He says, well, I I was drunk when this happened. Um, It's not my fault. Um, And progress is then stalled because after these diaries are revealed, the ethics committee asks him to turn them over voluntarily. And he's like, no, no, I won't be doing that. I'll give you like a transcript of them or some tapes of them. And it becomes clear very quickly once he finally hands those over that he has edited them. He has changed them. Um, So he is now obstructing justice by meddling with evidence. And it ultimately takes a subpoena that comes through the Supreme Court for him to be forced to turn over the real versions of his diaries. And that's a big part of the delay. And can we just say, I mean, you read earlier from part of his diaries, but when he was in the Senate, he also wrote that there were 22 staff members. He says, quote, 22 staff members I made love to and probably 75 others I've had a passionate relationship with. So we're talking about about 100 people that had that's, yeah, that's predatory behavior. Yes, I mean, that's yes. serial predatory for people behavior. who work for you, yes. whose jobs yes. are dependent on you. Yes, yeah. and you know, as I mentioned, Barbara Boxer, who's part of this new class, um, is a big voice for this, and she just keeps saying, like, we bring this up, we push for this, and then a year goes by, six months go by, you know, it just drags on and on and on. Um, eventually, 1995, the Ethics Committee has this indictment. As I said, over 10,000 pages long. It includes a lot of these diaries. Um, and he is kicked out. Mitch McConnell is the chairman of the Ethics Committee at the time. He refers to the habitual pattern of aggressive, blatantly sexual advances, mostly directed at members of his own staff. And he talks about the sort of uh, uh, attempts to alter and destroy his diary as part of the incriminating information here as well. Um, Before we get to how Packwood sort of says goodbye and frames it, which I think says a lot of his continued kind of mindset. Mm. Um, you know, it's not that long after, or it's sort of swirling in this moment, we also have Bill Clinton. Um, mm-hmm. And I think we just need to yeah. kind of bring that into the fold here, um, that the Senate at this moment, and, you know, Washington as a whole, is dealing with Anita Hill, mm-hmm. Packwood, and the allegations against Bill Clinton all in this sort of period. And I think it presages a lot of what would happen in, in the Me Too moment, yeah. you know, some 15 years later. I mean, it's it's the ultimate men behaving badly, but there's also, and you can, I know, Nikki, you will correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't after the Anita Hill trial for sure become sort of like the year of the woman, like mm-hmm. all of these women start running for political office. Uh, for the first time, you have Congresswoman senators um coming more than two women yeah 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 yeah. coming into these positions because it's like enough Mm -hmm. you do not know how to occupy this office with professionalism and respect and women start to occupy these spaces more and you can you can call it a backlash or a response but i mean it's one of these things where people were fed up with the amount of you know inappropriate behavior that was happening for men, the sexual harassment on both sides. And this is really on both sides of the aisle. I mean, this was not a Democratic or Republican thing. We should be clear about that, too. And yet, you know, you're seeing for the first time, really, consequences for um, abuse of power and sexual harassment, particularly of women. Um, And that's a really important turning point. But you're also seeing the politicization of those attacks, um, uh, which is to say that 
not everyone who is pursuing um, holding people responsible for sexual harassment actually care about sexual harassment. Yeah. Um, and so that becomes an issue in all of this as well. Because I think back to that Mitch McConnell quote that you just read, Jody. Um, you know, Republicans had just taken power in a wave election in 1994. And on on the one hand, they were putting themselves out as the more moral party. So Packwood represented a problem in that way. But they were also a far more conservative party. And Packwood didn't fit in the new Republican Party. Sure. He was pro-abortion rights. He was pro-woman um, and pro-the feminist movement in a way that just... <laughs> didn't fit at all. Um, and so it wasn't like McConnell was really so sad to be seeing the back of him. Hmm. Um, and, you know, the attacks on Clinton, they were often bipartisan, um, but yeah. they also like were weaponized into impeachment, um, which was maybe a bridge too far. So there's a yeah. it, it's interesting to see this as a real issue being taken seriously, but also being pulled into this partisan moment. And I think we see that reflected in, you know, what kind of actual reckoning is there? We see that reflected in uh, Packwood's goodbye speech. He gives this lengthy goodbye to the Senate that is basically all about the Senate body, not about his actions. Right. And so he basically says, like, I'm resigning because it's the honorable thing to do for the Senate. And I have brought dishonor on the Senate. Moreover, he refers to, quote, the dishonor that has befallen me, mm-hmm. which is just such slippery uh, uh, you know, tre- language but never that really talking voice? about yeah, know, exactly never I talking know. about my actions more talking about the the dishonor to this great body um and so you know there's no real level of accountability there yeah. either and um you know i will say we saw a lot of that kind of language um in in, in 2017 around me too but i think we did see a little more people calling it out and saying no 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 this is about your actions mm-hmm. this is not about anything else um first and foremost so there was that but certainly when we got to 2017 and there was a lot of conversations around this same kind of abuse of power um people looked back at this moment and said gosh i thought we were kind of done with this i think it's possible to say the conversation has moved forward um i'm one of those people who think that the me too movement didn't go far enough like there wasn't enough sort of systematic and structural change um the conversation has moved forward but it is still such an endemic problem in the, in the world, in the United States, um, that it feels sometimes, even though you get this progress on some fronts, to be intractable on some level. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I also think there's, you know, there were a lot of scandals that came out, too, about, like, politicians and, and infidelity. And I'm not trying to dismiss infidelity, um, but at the same time, there are real conversations to be had about consent and sexual harassment and power yeah. dynamics. It's one thing for two consenting adults to have an affair or cheat. It's a whole nother thing when you are a predator and you are preying upon women in your office and there's absolutely no consent. And even just thinking of his diary when he's like, I had, you know, 22 affairs or these, you know, it's like, were those consensual? I don't think any of those were consensual, you know? And so, again, there's the way that you can couch it to make it seem like these were two consenting adults that just had a relationship. Um, And then there's all the other stuff. This seat, people might know this um, seat was taken over by Ron Wyden, who won a seat in a special election, and he has held it ever since. So, you know, it's a real connection. And, you know, Ryden is a figure here. Boxer, you know, is a figure here still until very recently in the Senate. Packwood is still alive. You know, I think mm-hmm. he's 93 or something, but you know, he's out there. So, um, yeah, very, very recent history. Um, all right. Well, we will leave it there. This has been suggested to us by a number of people, so I'm glad we got to it. Um, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. First of all, no workplace in America ought to tolerate the kind of offensive, degrading sexual misconduct that the Ethics Committee finds Senator Packwood to be guilty of. And it certainly cannot be tolerated in the United States Senate either. Radiotopia.